This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Wednesday, and that means it's time for another deck history video. In this series, I trace the development of prominent deck archetypes from their beginnings all the way to the present day. As usual, I ran a poll to determine the topic of this week's video, and it was one of the most one-sided polls I've ever seen, with Cascade decks winning in a massive landslide. Cascade is a mechanic that made its debut in Alara Reborn. If a card has Cascade, when you cast it, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card with a lower mana value, and then you can cast that card without paying its mana cost. Obviously, this is inherently powerful, and can lead to some degenerate things happening. Even if you counter the spell with Cascade, the cascading still happens, making it very difficult to deal with. While there are several decks that utilize Cascade cards like Bloodbraid Elf and Shardless Agent, this video is going to focus in particular on decks that are really built around various combos involving Cascade, and not every deck that has a card with Cascade in it. For the most part, Bloodbraid Elf and Shardless Agent decks aren't really Cascade decks, they're simply decks that have cards in them with Cascade. In particular, we'll look at four separate archetypes that abuse Cascade. In three of these decks, suspend cards were combined with it for very powerful results. Because some of these suspend cards have no mana value, if you built your deck correctly, you could make sure anytime you cast a card with Cascade, you're going to hit one of these powerful cards, which is very nice. We'll also take a brief look at Valky Cascade decks. These various decks have found success in Extended Modern and Legacy, and in this video we'll take a look at how and why these decks changed over time. We're going to begin with a look at Extended Hypergenesis, as it was the first deck that sought to abuse the synergy between Cascade and Suspend cards. The first player to pilot one of these decks to a top 8 finish was Evangelos Papat Saruchis, who top 8ed Pro Tour Austin with a Hypergenesis deck. Hypergenesis is one of these cards with Suspend and no casting cost, so it has a mana value of 0. When it does get cast, it lets both players alternate between playing any artifact, creature, enchantment, or land from their hand onto the battlefield. While the effect is symmetrical, obviously decks built around it are at an advantage, as they will have all kinds of silly things to cheat into play. The deck uses some of the most powerful creatures of the time, including Progenitus, Angel of Despair, and Bogarden Hellkite, among others. Getting the Hellkite or Angel into play was particularly nice, because it could allow you to negate whatever your opponent might have put into play for free. What made the deck so scary, though, was how early and consistently it could cast Hypergenesis. The deck runs 10 cards with Cascade that have a mana value of 3, Demonic Dread, Violent Outburst, and Ardent Plea. Because the deck doesn't run any cards with a mana value less than 3 aside from Hypergenesis, every time you cast one of these Cascade cards, Hypergenesis was going to happen. And the deck could do it as early as turn 2, thanks to Simeon Spirit Guide and Gemstone Caverns. In the following year, Tomoharo Saito piloted his Hypergenesis deck to a top 8 finish at Grand Prix Oakland. The deck is still entirely built around comboing off, as you can see, though there are a few new inclusions in terms of the creatures that the deck cheats into play, with Terastodon the biggest new inclusion. It gave the deck another way to make sure to get rid of any problem permanence the opponent might manage to cheat into play, provided they weren't creatures. Ultimately, Hypergenesis decks were deemed too fast and too consistent for Extended. The fact that they could go off on turn 3 with regularity, and could even go off on turn 2 sometimes, was just too much for the format, and as a result, Hypergenesis got banned out of the format in June of 2010, and that of course brought an end to Hypergenesis decks in the format. While people have tried different versions of the deck in other formats, like Legacy, it's never really managed to top 8 any significant events. Another Cascade deck also top 8 Grand Prix Oakland though, one with a much different game plan, this one based around Living End. Living End is another suspend card with a mana value of 0, and it has a somewhat convoluted effect. First, it exiles all creature cards in all graveyards, then both players sacrifice all the creatures they have in play, and then those cards that were exiled from the graveyards are placed on the battlefield. In short, it wipes out everything on the board and reanimates everything that was in graveyards when you cast Living End. Like Hypergenesis, the effect is symmetrical, but the decks that play Living End are of course better equipped to abuse the card. Travis Wu was the originator of the Living End deck, and he also piloted it to a top 8 finish at Grand Prix Oakland. The game plan was, of course, still casting cards with Cascade that would always hit a Suspend card, but it did take a little more work to make Living End work than Hypergenesis. 
you couldn't just have a couple of super powerful creatures in your hand and go for it. You had to make sure your graveyard was well stocked, and there was also not really a reason to play creatures ahead of it since they were going to die. In order to make that happen, the deck ran a bunch of creatures with cycling, like Street Wraith and Jungle Weaver. Almost every creature in the deck had cycling, with the only exceptions being Ingot Chewer and Fulminator Mage, but both of them could be sacrificed, so they would also end up in your well-stocked graveyard. But yeah, all of this cycling would load up the graveyard and help you find a card with Cascade, then you would go off, blow up your opponent's whole board, and have a table filled with 6 threes and 5 sixes. This would be the deck's only top 8 in Extended, as Extended ended as a format not too long after Grand Prix Oakland. However, Living Index would make the transition to the new modern format, finding some success starting in 2012. Joe Hemmen was the first to top 8 with the deck in Modern, which he did at Grand Prix Kansas City in 2013. Modern had a much larger pool of cards than Extended did, as all cards from 8th edition on were legal in the format, so the deck did have some differences from what it looked like in Extended. Obviously the game plan was still to put a bunch of creatures in your graveyard and cascade into Living End, so the only notable differences basically come in the creatures that the deck runs. In particular, Avalanche Riders and Spike Feeder gave the deck two different utility creatures. The Riders could blow up a land and then go to the graveyard on your next turn, and the Feeder could block and gain you life to buy you the necessary time to pull off your combo. The deck really hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. We don't need to talk about every little difference that the deck has had over the years. Most of them just amount to a deck simply running different creatures with sacrifice effects or cycling. So let's fast forward all the way to today so you can see the ways the deck has, and hasn't, changed over the last decade or so. As you can see, the deck of course seeks to cascade into Living End. Shardless Agent was given a modern legal reprint in Modern Horizons 2 and provided the deck with a new powerful cascade card. The deck also includes another Modern Horizons 2 card in Grief, a new very powerful evoke creature who could disrupt your opponent and then wait in the graveyard until Living End gets cast. Some other new and generally more impressive cyclers are in the deck too. In particular, you've got Curator of Mysteries, which could cycle for only a single blue mana and provide an impressive body when it got reanimated, Striped Riverwinder, which is a huge serpent with hexproof, and Waker of Waves. The Waker doesn't technically have cycling, but its ability is actually a better version of cycling. And then when it gets reanimated, it's absolutely massive, and also, if your opponent happened to get some stuff back from their graveyard, it'll be weaker because of Waker of Waves. Living End has generally not been a dominant deck in Modern over the years, but it's always been around and it's always putting up a few top 8s at major events every year, and I think that will continue. The deck's game plan is just so good. Cycle away a bunch of stuff until you find your combo, and then those very cards that were cycled come back and win the game in a single swing in many cases. The next Cascade deck we'll look at is Valky Cascade a deck that emerged in both Modern and Legacy in early 2021. It's also the only deck we'll look at in this video that doesn't involve the suspend cards with a mana value of zero, but it was still a deck that sought to abuse a quirk in the rules about mana value, in this case with regard to how modal double face cards worked. As you can tell from the name, the deck's biggest power play was to cascade into Valky. Now, in today's rules, this combo doesn't work, but the rules were changed because of this deck. At the time, you could cast a 3-mana card with Cascade like Violent Outburst, and this would allow you to hit Valky. This is because when a modal double face card is in your deck, or in your hand, only the mana value for the front card is what matters. It's only once the card goes on the stack that the other mana value matters. So this means when you cascade into Valky, you have the option between casting either side, and that meant that you could cast Tybalt Cosmic Imposter on turn three. And he's a powerful planeswalker that rips apart the opponent's hand in the library, and then lets the player who controls him cast those cards that are exiled. That's an incredibly difficult thing to overcome, and it could go down on turn two thanks to Simeon's Spirit Guide. The deck utterly dominated Modern during February of 2021, before the rules were changed. Now, if you Cascade, the spell you cast for free has to have a mana value lower than the card with Cascade. This meant the end of Tybalt shenanigans in both Modern and Legacy. Let's take a quick look at the Legacy version of Valky Cascade, which like the Modern version was only a deck in February of 2021. Legacy of course has a larger card pool, but the deck still isn't very different. It had access to more free counter magic to protect the combo, and, well, that's really the only major difference. So, incredibly powerful modern and legacy Valky Cascade decks were very short-lived thanks to a rule change. Let's transition now to the most recent Cascade deck to show up in modern, Modern Crashing Footfalls. Before we get to talking about that deck in particular, we have to talk about its precursor. 
The first deck to run the Footfalls in Modern wasn't a Cascade deck at all. It was one that still sought to abuse suspend cards with a mana value of zero, but it didn't do it with Cascade. It did it with cards like As Foretold, Electro Dominance, and Finale of Promise. These cards could allow you to play these cards without suspend, without paying for any of them. The deck features three of these suspend cards, Ancestral Vision, Crashing Footfalls, and Restore Balance. However, by 2021, it was becoming clear that Crashing Footfalls was by far the most consistent of these. It may not have been as powerful as Living End or Restore Balance or even Hypergenesis, but you didn't really need to set things up to take advantage of the fact that you would get two Rhinos for free. Additionally, not long after this event, Simeon's Spirit Guide got banned, and that made it harder for this more combo-oriented deck to go off early enough. By early 2021, decks combining Footfalls with Cascade arrived on the scene. Let's take a look at the deck that finished in first at the Magic Online Champion Showcase for Modern in 2021, which was one of the first Cascade Footfalls decks to top 8 a major event. While the deck does run the usual cards of Cascade to get Footfalls going, the deck also runs a bunch of cards that are just good cards to have. The deck had space for powerful adventure creatures like Bone Crusher Giant and Brazen Borrower, and these were also nice because they had effects that you could cast on turn 2, even if their mana value was still not one that would be hit with Cascade. The deck also has access to nice control pieces like Cryptic Command and Fire and Ice. The deck was less all-in on Cascade, but having an incredibly fast start where you get a couple of Rhinos was still one of the deck's primary power plays. Crashing Footfall Cascade decks are still a thing in modern today, and if we take a look at a 2021 version of the deck, we see not a whole lot has changed. The deck does now feature the powerful Murktide Regent, but the game plan of the deck is pretty much identical. It can play a control game if it needs to, or it can just overwhelm you with Rhinos early. There's also a version of Crashing Footfalls in Legacy. It hasn't found nearly as much consistent success, but it is worth looking at. This deck top aided the Magic Online Legacy Challenge in October, and you can see many of the same elements. The only major change is that the deck can do its stuff much faster, in particular with the help of both, Elvish and Simeon Spirit Guide, you can get two Rhinos into play as early as turn one. Decks using Cascade for incredibly fast starts, or for combos, have left a large mark on the game across multiple formats. Living End, especially, has been a major player in Modern for a long period of time, and that looks like it's going to continue to be the case going forward. So, that's the history of the various Cascade decks that have left their mark on competitive magic. Don't forget to vote on this week's poll in the community tab so that you can have a say in the topic for next week's video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to stay aware of future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on the past episodes of this series, and there's more than 20 of them, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. Lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can do that on Patreon. Thanks for watching.